So this will be a little bit different from what we've been listening to the last day and a half because um, number one, I'm going to use primarily uh, the overhead projector. I was, uh, the, or the, com the computer projector because I was under the, uh, I, I have a f strange fascination for putting LaTeX into, uh, you know, writing my slides into LaTeX and then copying them onto the computer. No, and also because the other reason it's a little bit different is because um, I think what I'm going to talk about is a lot less formal and, uh, than, than what we've heard from Howard and, and Mike and Basile, uh, and a little bit more of applications. So you'll see, or, or yeah, applications by nature. Um, and you'll see a, a lot of, hopefully, of things that, that we've seen up till now. But, um, but I, I have to apologize. The math, the mathematics will be very uh, um, impressionistic. Uh, so if you really want, if you want the details, I mean, there will be equations and there will be a quiz, uh, but, but um, if you want the details, actually, it's been very well covered up till now or will be in the near future. So the other thing I just want to do is because I've had several conversations with people and no one ever knows where Brown University is. So this is where Brown <laughs> University is. It's, it's in Rhode Island, which is the smallest state in the United States, uh, just south of Boston, just north of Princeton. Uh, and this is what it looks like when it's snowing. This year we had a lot of snow, three meters of snow this year. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this, uh, and, but this is more important. This is what it looks like now. So this is a very pleasant campus. And yes, it is a very, if you're going to the East Coast and you're in between visiting uh, Mike in New York and Howard in Princeton, then you can just take the train. This is America where you can take a train and come to Providence <laughs> and come and visit Brown. All right, so this is what I'm going to talk about the next three sets of days uh, of these lectures. I'm going to talk about swimming, um, swimming uh, as an application of low Reynolds number hydrodynamics and the fluid structure or flexible structures in, 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 fluid, in low Reynolds number systems. Today I'll talk a lot about uh, flagella motility, particularly of bacteria. Tomorrow we'll talk about eukaryotes, so that those are uh, more complicated, um, active flagella, sperm and, and chlamydomonas, um, and a little bit of hi and hydrodynamics. And hopefully by then, Howard, when, when the, where, is Howard back? Is he here? Hopefully by then Howard will have talked about uh, um, singularity expansions of the uh, Stokes equation. <laughs> uh, and then the last day is a sort of a catch-all, which will probably change between now and then, uh, of uh, non-Newtonian collective swimming, transport, and, and robotics. Uh, and it's a little, as I say, it's a little less fundamental. I hope to get into the fundamental stuff, but still a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, sort of how we can apply the ideas that we've been looking at. So the first things I'll do is to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that you've already heard, but hopefully hearing it a second or even a third time, will, will, uh, it will sound familiar. So oh, first, before that, a whole list of, um, of um, papers. Eric Lauger and Tom Powers wrote a very nice review article. That's the very first one on low Reynolds number swimming. It's now a little bit old, so it's not hasn't been you know, uh, updated, obviously, but that's really a great article if, you, if uh, people want to see that one. And there's a whole bunch of others. All right, so once again, we have a low Reynolds number flow, the Navier-Stokes equations, which, which Howard derived. I've written them here in the non-dimensional form um, with the pressure gradient and the viscous stresses on the right-hand side and the inertial terms on the left-hand side. And by, when we non-dimensionalize by characteristic velocities and lengths, we end up with a Reynolds number and we have a Struhl number multiplying the time derivative. And so we end up with, uh, we can throw away that term and end up with the Stokes equations. Okay? Um, what's the regression number? A str Struhl. So that's a, uh, so that's a, uh, that is a, here's a chalk. Uh, that is a uh, UD over, no. F over FD, is, am I using D or L? L. Uh, so I have a one over time. So this is why I'm, uh, 
I'm, uh, it's, uh, I have a velocity on t uh, one of seconds. So I have a velocity here, and I have a length scale here. That's a screw on number, I believe. It's measure, measuring, measuring frequency. All right, so um, we're way down here with bacteria. The, the, the video that you saw earlier, this is, this is a different video that, that from, from the same vi uh, movie um, that uh, we saw from, um, from G.I. Taylor. And I won't show it just because Howard showed it uh, earlier on, but uh, showing the kinematic reversibility that, that comes at low Reynolds number. So this is a slightly different version from the same video where the blob of fluid rotates around and then rotates back and remains a blob. <laughs> so we have kinematic reversibility. And as Howard explained this morning, or reminded people this morning, this results in a lovely theorem, which is known as the, the scallop theorem, thanks to Ed Purcell. Um, if you're not familiar with Ed Purcell, it's worthwhile getting to know him. He was an, he's won the Nobel Prize for for magnetic resonance, uh, discovering nuclear or formalizing nuclear magnetic resonance in high energy physics, and then saw the light and decided that what was really interesting was low Reynolds number swimming and wrote this beautiful paper, which was actually a result of a talk he gave. And all of the figures are his hand drawn notes from, from that paper. It's, a, it's really a lovely paper. Um, um, and, um, and he has the scallop theorem, which, which Howard explained. And I'll just remind people once again, you have a scallop. If, you, if that scallop closes its uh, shell, it will propel itself backwards. Um, and at low Reynolds number, when it tries to open its shell again, because it's kinematically reversible, it will go right back to where it started. Um, so this is the challenge of low Reynolds number swimming, is we cannot swim like a scallop. Uh, a very simple example of that for people who want a physical um, um, uh, explanation, or physical uh, demonstration of, of the lack of kinematic re reversibility is to take your hand and blow on your hand, and then suck against your hand. And on one way you feel the air, and the other way you don't feel the air. And the reason is, is because it's not kinematically reversible. You have separation going out, and you have on the, on the, on the in-stroke, it's, it's not reversible because the Reynolds number is too high. If you were to do this with your face immersed in honey, <laughs> then you would, you would I, trust me, you would feel <laughs> both the in-stroke and the out-stroke. You would feel it deeply. <laughs> All right, so this movie I will show. And I'm going to try and play the, uh, the soundtrack as well. So, so you should be able to hear it with G.I. Taylor speaking. And this, Howard showed a little excerpt of this. I'm going to show the whole excerpt about what the scallop theorem has with respect to reciprocal and non-reciprocal swimmers. So you listen carefully and you'll hear G.I. Taylor speaking. This is from this movie series. about a hinge at the rear. Waving the rudder of a boat is so well known as a method of propulsion that the rules of yacht racing legislate against it. I love that line. <laughs> Putting this model in water shows us why. But when the model is put into syrup, it cannot move.
Got it. It's too late. <laughs> All right, that was G.I. Taylor um, demonstrating the 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 the, the, the diff the, why a regular swimmer uh, the, that you would be familiar with as a fish or as a if you're a yachtsman a uh, tilling uh, why that does not work at low Reynolds number because of kinematic reversibility uh, and why uh, as Howard explained or showed a spiral which has a chiral motion a non-reciprocal motion uh, is constantly generating a force moving in that direction we'll come back to that because of course spirals are ubiquitous in low Reynolds number uh, organisms and so we'll come back and spend a lot of time talking about spirals but let me just also mention a couple of other non-reciprocal swimmers so this one actually the first one is the one that also Howard mentioned is the Purcell swimmer um, so this is a three link swimmer that can undergo a non-reciprocal motion as we saw so we saw that it, it, it executes a, a uh, it, it carves out an area in phase space in the theta 1 theta 2 um, uh, uh, description of phase space and because it, execu it executes a closed path that encloses an area then it's an, it's a, it, it, we, you, one can show that that, dem that uh, generates a swimming motion uh, so this is the classic Purcell swimmer this is a more recent one and uh, well before I s and then let me just say something about this so if you can imagine doing this with a many linked swimmer so that three links is the simplest possible swimmer right because you have two degrees of freedom there but you could clearly add another link and another link and another link and then you can have a continuum of motions that could generate what looks a little bit like a propagating wave you can if you squint your eyes you can think of this as a propagating wave that is that the Purcell swimmer is is emulating and so this is an undulatory swimmer that that, uh, that is generating a propagating wave that is gen that is pro responsible for its propulsion the helix is generating a chiral uh, a helical wave uh, and the last one that I'll mention is this one by uh, Najafi and Golestanian, which is this three balled uh, swimmer that moves in the following way. Let's see, just, this has a little, yeah. So there are three balls, one, two, and three. Uh, and you can see there's a thick line and a thin line that connects them. And in each of these sequences, one of these lines will expand or contract. So here, as we go from here to here, this segment will contract. As we go from here to here, the second segment will contract. As we go from here to here, the first segment will expand. And as we go from here to here, the second segment will expand. So it's, it's a linear version of this, where you have two degrees of freedom. And in each, se in each st segment of motion, the links between the three balls are swimming, are expanding or contracting. You can calculate this very nicely. You can do a lot of analysis on this as well, because you can treat each one of these, as we heard this morning, as a, uh, a you, because you can model it as a sphere uh, in a Stokes flow. If you ignore the interactions between the two between these, you can you can you can uh, do the analysis, um, and you can do a lot of nice um, analysis to to understand how this swims uh, as a result of uh, this motion and the amplitude and the so forth, the efficiency of swimming, how much it will propagate forward as it. Uh, as it undergoes this motion. Yes? Well, because this one has two degrees of freedom which, uh, which undergo alternate uh, phase, uh, alternate switching. So in this case, th this leg goes down to here, and then that leg goes down. So in, in each segment of the swimming motion, uh, one, of the, one of the motions uh, changes state. And that's the same thing here, that each of these two degrees of freedom has a plus state and a minus state, so it expands or contracts in this, in this fashion. So you can describe this in a phase space very similar, almost exactly the same yeah, as this. Well, because it's, it, there, nothing is moving up and down. This is all going, oh. right? You're, it's just, and, and the, the, um, the comment I want to make about this is that this, if you, again, if you think of this as a, Multi multiple uh, ball organism, each one of those segments is expanding contraction. It looks a lot like a, a worm that is kind of crawling along by, by generating a contractile and expand, expanding wave, so a, or a slinky. 
Do you have slinkies? They still exist. That's I grew up with a slinky, <laughs> right? It, and and this so this we might call a squirmer. The squirmer being the fact that the the, the surface is moving in a, a there, there is a traveling wave along the surface. The actual boundary condition of the surface is moving, and we'll see a little bit of squirmers uh, coming along uh, later on. As so, these are three potential non-reciprocal swimmers, swimmers that execute swimming or devices that execute swimming motion at low Reynolds number. We're going to spend almost all our time, or all of our time today, on the first one. And so now let me show you this, and we'll take a little step into biology. So this is actually a picture that Lighthill, Sir James Lighthill, who was not a biologist but spent a lot of time in the world of biology, uh, put together for um, another great paper from 1970, uh, the talk was in 1975, um, and it is the landscape of microorganisms. And you can see here, uh, you don't have to try to uh, read everything, but there, is, uh, there, are, uh, a, there are prokaryotes at the top and eukaryotes at the bottom. And then there are algae and fungi on the left and protozoan on the right. So prokaryotes are single-celled organisms that do not have a nucleus. Eukaryotes do have a nucleus. We all are eukaryotes, as are, as are almost all, um, well, everyone except for these guys. And these are all small bacteria and single-celled elementary organisms. Um, down here is, uh, are small organisms. And if we keep going down in the eukaryotes, we get to dogs and cats and people. Uh, this circle represents everything that has a flagellum of one kind or another. And uh, the intersection is the prokaryotes with flagella are these ones that we've seen a little bit of already. And we're going to see more, a lot more of today. So there's multi-flagellated uh, bacteria, uniflagellated bacteria, and all kinds of others that are here. And then tomorrow, we'll spend a lot more time down here with the eukaryotic bacteria, eukaryotic organisms, I should say. OK, so let's, uh, yeah, so these are the, uh, I have a little remote here I can use. So these are the prokaryotes, E. coli, Colobacter is a single cell, single flagell flagellated organism. And then down here we have, uh, multi uh, we have um, uh, eukaryotes, so we have paramecium, which have multiple cilia, these tiny little flagella that are active, and chlamydomonas, which have two flagella. And the big difference between these guys and these guys is these have a passive flagellum. It's a, it's a passive filament that is coiled like a helix but is not actuated. It's just a, it's a uh, um, deformable but, but, but passive structure. Whereas these guys have an active structure. The actual, the actual flagellum has internal motors that can make it move and drive itself through the fluid. And so we'll talk more about those. And they, obviously, they have a different different role. How are we doing? Everyone with us? Good. All right, so now, this would take forever to do on the board. So this is why it's great to use the computer. So here we go again. These are the, the eukaryotes, the active flagella. This is a bull sperm swimming. And this is a, a um, chlamydomonas swimming. You can see there are two flagella there. And this is the passive flagella. Um, that have uh, a, either a single, um, uh, a single flagellum that is being rotated in the, in the way that the helix, you saw the helix rotating, or we have this patric these patricious um, uh, bacteria, which have, if you look carefully, they have multiple flagella. So you can see them, uh, they have a single, they, they look like they have a single flagellum, but then suddenly they kind of break apart. If you've seen the movie The Matrix, the matrix robots are based on these patricious bacteria. Sentinels, sentinels thank you. The, sent <laughs> the sentinels that invade and that are trying to break in, those are e la very large E. coli. And let's not get into it. Unless the matrix was living in a weird world, it's physically impossible that those things exist. <laughs> but I guess it was a weird world, wasn't it? Uh, anyway. All right, so uh, these are the active flagella, these are the passive flagella, and we're going to spend all our time today on monotricious, which is a single flagellum, and peritricious, which is multi-flagella. All right, so now let's spend, let's zero down on 
multi-flagellated per peritricious bacteria. So the godfather of peritricious bacteria of E. coli is Howard Berg. And you will see that name everywhere. He's a wonderful, um, uh, uh, a really generous and, uh, person with, uh, and, an incredibly, and has an incredible achievement in identifying how these guys swim and everything about how they swim for the last 40 years. So you'll see his name on, on very many papers. So he took this video in his lab uh, by staining the... And I should make one other comment about my talk. So I'm primarily an experimentalist. I, I like to think that I understand more theory than some other experimentalists, but I'm primarily an experimentalist. And so I will spend, uh, unlike some people who will give you a background on some of the more technical uh, uh, analytic techniques that they might be using, I'm going to give you, try to give you a little background on some of the experimental techniques that people have been using to study these things, um, and, um, and as well as hopefully the, the theoretical backgrounds as well. So, they, so what Howard did was he, he found a way to stain these bacteria. These are around one micron. Uh, the head is about one micron here. And the, fla the flagella are around 10 microns long. And they're around 70 nanometers wide. Sorry, 20 nanometers wide. So very, very thin. Your, your hair is about 50 nanometers wide, 50 microns wide. So these, these filaments shown here, 20 nanometers wide, they're very, very narrow. Uh, very long. If you have something that is long and narrow, what kind of theory might you use? Very good. We've, they've been paying attention. <laughs> okay, good. This is an ideal candidate for slender body theory. Um, uh, and, and we'll make good use of it. So how do these guys swim? Well, they have multiple flagella. And as you can see, what happens is each one, well, each one of these flagella is connected to a motor. That motor is a rotary motor that turns, in, in the case of E. coli, in the terms of these bacteria, it turns predominantly counterclockwise. And most of them are turning counterclockwise most of the time. But every once in a while, they change direction and they, turn clock, they, they, they rotate clock, clockwise. Okay? So, and it's random. Uh, it's, it's random with a little bit of direction depending on food and, and light and things like that. So most of them are, are counterclockwise? Uh, for the peritricious bacteria, yes. Um, the, it, 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 so I think until recently it was thought to be just random, but now it's turning out that, that there are... So, so the other bacteria that we look at, that uh, the monotrish bacteria, turn predominantly clockwise, and they have right-handed helices instead of left-handed helices. And so there's questions as to how these things, wh why these things chose the directions. It's, I think evolutionary, it's just purely random, but, but the connections between them may not be random. But these guys uh, all turn counterclockwise, and in fact, the bacterial motor is a preserved characteristic across thousands of, of bacterial species. So it, it evolved very, very early in the evolution of life, and it is preserved across many, many species of bacteria that exist in many, many different environments. Um, the motor itself is an incredible piece of uh, molecular hardware. It's powered, in this case, by uh, protons, by hydrogen uh, and, uh, ions that, that diffuse or, or don't, don't diffuse, that, that, that uh, transport through the motor and power the, power the uh, motor due to a pH imbalance between the inside and the outside of the membrane. And what happens is when all of these guys are rotating counterclockwise, and we'll see, we'll see some more of this in a minute, all of the flagella are turning together, and you can see that they bundle up into what is called a bundle, and it looks uh, mechanically like a single helix. So it's a single helix made up of, in this case, four flagella that rotate, co-rotate around each other. Sort of, so if you think about the, the, the geometry of it, they're actually sliding over each other. Um, and, and they act mechanically as a single helix and propel the, the organism through the fluid. And we'll see more about that in just a second. Now, I don't, I, yes. They are relatively stiff. You can see them here looking pretty, pretty um, stiff, but, but as, they, as they flay apart, they, will, um, they do have a persistence length that is of the order of uh, three, three microns. So they, they are flexible, but they're, 
not terribly flexible. Um, they're The helix, so, so, so we could have the whole hour on the helix. The helix is a self-assembled self -assembled structure that is made up of, a two, I think, two proteins, uh, flagellin alpha and flagellin beta, which self-assemble during the growth of the, of the cell, and they self-assemble into a helical shape. And we'll come back to that in a minute, so hold off on that. But the helix is, is the natural uh, rest structure of, the, of this bacterium. Now what happens is every once in a while, as I mentioned, the, the, the motor counter rotates and it goes clockwise. One, at least one of them will do this and it will do it at random. And that's what executes what you see here is this so-called tumble. What happens when, when a tumble occurs is the, the, the one motor ro rotates in the opposite direction. That messes up the entire synchron synchronicity of the, um, uh, of the bundle. The whole thing comes apart, and because there is no inertia, right, with Stokes' law, this Reynolds number is 10 to the minus 5, because there's no inertia, the minute the bundle comes apart, the, the organism stops uh, in the water. With, it doesn't coast at all. It stops right there. The helices, the, uh, the motors are still turning, some clockwise, at least one, some counterclockwise, at least one clockwise. It undergoes an active reorientation due to the fact that there is these, ran these helices kind of flaying around. And then what happens is the, the motors decide to go counter, to co-rotate all in the counterclockwise direction. The bundle reforms and the animal goes off. Here's the, here's the bundle reforming and the animal goes off uh, in a new direction. So it undergoes this active Brownian motion, this active random walk. Um, not Brownian motion, random walk. Uh, and this is called the run and tumble sequence. So it runs, it tumbles. Let me just twiddle this. Is, there we go. It should be red, but uh, anyway. So it undergoes this run and tumble. It runs for a while. It tumbles. It runs for a while. It tumbles. The run length is uh, relatively random because it... Um, because the, these motors change direction uh, randomly, and so that and the, ori the reorientation is random. It's an active uh, angular reorientation, so it undergoes this this uh, random walk. The last thing I'll say, which I won't really talk much about uh, until Thursday, is that if there happens to be a gradient of something, so there was there is a gradient you can see here from something. Let's call that something bad to something good. No food to lots of food cold to warm, uh, in some cases dark to light, or, gra or uh, the gradient of gravity. There are gra the, so if there is a gradient of some nature, and the bacterium is tuned to, to sense that gradient, it will run a little longer when it sees something that it likes. So it's continually sensing the environment through its membrane. And if it likes that gradient, it will run just a little bit longer. It will, it will push the bias of the, of the, of the motor uh, counter rotation back a little bit and so it will run a little bit longer and when it goes against the gradient it will run a little bit shorter and as a result it undergoes a directed random walk and it can climb the gradient and that's known as taxis, chemotaxis for chemical, phototaxis for light and so forth. Question? Um, uh, how much does this particular tumble motion? The, so um, let me think about this. The, the, so the, the, the motor is rotating at around 100 hertz. Uh, the, each, each run motion is of the order of maybe um, half a second or so. Is that about right? Sorry? Is a run. Whoa, OK. So that's longer than I, than I remember. So, one, so let's call it one second. Uh, and the tumble itself is relatively fast. The tumble is, is a few milliseconds, is tens of milliseconds. No, the tumble is relatively um, c consistent. What changes is the length of time that each motor stays in the counterclockwise direction. So if you're, if you're climbing a gradient, it will spend longer in the counterclockwise direction, which means the bundle will stay together a little bit longer, which means the run will last a little bit longer. Yeah? Stop 
So, so, we'll, so we'll see that. that. That's a very good question. Why does the, why does the, you're asking why does the filament just not tie itself in a knot? Yes, yeah, so why they can continue so, so, so we'll see that in just a minute. So that's a good question and we'll see that. So hold on. Yeah. In, it, in this case, it's, an, it's a, effectively an infinite fluid. Um, so, so the bacteria, as you see, I mean, from head to tail are maybe five to, ten mic, five to seven microns. Uh, these videos and many of the others you'll see are in channels that are maybe 50 or 100 microns. Um, so there is potentially, if you're really worrying about things, there could be a, a wall effect because of the 1 over R dependence. But we're far enough from the wall that we're not seeing um, wall effects. There are many, I don't think, well, no, I, I will on Wednesday talk about interactions with surfaces. No, if you, no, they're completely 3D. Um, I won't play it again because I want to keep moving. But they, trust me, they're 3D. I know this because we track them. <laughs> okay, let's move on. So how did Howard Berg do this? This is a little historical note on experimental methods, which we'll come back to. He built, um, before the days of integrated circuits, he built a, a tracking microscope. And a tracking microscope is, uh, is a microscope here uh, with a box with, I like this, box with bacteria. Um, so that's, that part is the microscope. And uh, what he did is he took the image that comes from the microscope, he split it into three, uh, and uh, actually so he split it into um, three components. One of them is the X um, direction, one of them is the Y direction, and one of them is the Z direction. And the way he did that, I won't spend a lot of time, but people can ask me later, is he used fiber optics, which again, remember 1971, so this was he, what in the paper he calls fiber optics, plastic tubes you can buy from a from an optics catalog or something like that. I mean, this was before the days of the fiber of the optical revolution. Um, and then uh, depending, so if the bacteria moves to the side, this cell will get lighter, sorry, darker, because he was using dark field microscopy. So this will get darker, this will get lighter. So you'll get a differential signal on a photo detector, and that will drive the stage to the left. Same thing for driving the stage to the upper, uh, to the uh, to up and down, and then the Z direction uh, had, a diff had a slightly different mechanism, which I won't go into, but, but it was due to defocusing of the, of the cell when it moves in and out of the, of the focal plane of the microscope. Um, for people who do microscopy, this is an amazing piece of hardware uh, today uh, as it was 40 years ago, it's, um, and we'll come back to that. All right, another, another diversion about the bacterial motor. So the bacterial motor, I like to compare the bacterial motor with a modern-day motor, a, a GE90 on a Boeing 777 airplane. Um, they have a, a, a range of scales of about 10 to the 8. Um, the power source is uh, uh, somewhat different, protons versus jet fuel. They go at uh, uh, 300 meters per second versus uh, around 10 microns a second, or, or maybe 100 microns if you're really booking it. Uh, 350,000 kilograms versus 10 to the minus 15 kilograms. The thrust is a little bit different. What I like is this number, the thrust to weight ratio. So the thrust to weight ratio of a, of a modern aircraft engine is 2.4 and of a bacterium is 400. So they're really good at, at, uh, at really a, um, sort of a, a lot of power per, per kilogram in there. And the best one is the passenger kilo, kilometers per liter. How fuel efficient is this device? In this guy, you can go about five kilometers on a liter of fuel. Sorry, you can take five passengers one kilometer on a liter of fuel. Here, you could take 10 to the 15 passengers a kilometer on a liter for fuel. We'll all be long dead by the time he gets there, but it's really fuel efficient. So the passenger is the bacteria versus the, the So the passenger, I didn't really mention that. This is the, this is the passenger, and that's, that's, the, that's the motor. Water, a glucose, I guess. I mean, it's protons. Sure. <laughs> Don't ask too many questions. <laughs> this, I, I want to I say silly comparisons. I reckon. 
All right. Um, OK, how does this motor actually work in a little bit more scientific way? So again, this is experiments from Howard's group. Uh, this is actually the most recent of these experiments. And the reason it's, if you can make that out, there is a yellow line that goes down there. Um, and the reason it's, it's long been thought it's a constant torque reversible motor. But very recently, just, um, well, f five years ago now, uh, it was discovered that the, the counterclockwise and the clockwise torque are different. So it's actually an asymmetric motor. It, it drives itself. Um, it has a stronger torque in the counterclockwise, which you remember is the drive direction. And when it counter rotates, which for the, for the E. coli serves no function other than to reorient, it actually has a, uh, a, a less powerful motor uh, uh, torque speed relationship. This is essentially a constant torque motor, which again will be important. And one more time, how did they measure this? Uh, this is an updated version of, of um, uh, this is another beautiful experimental technique. So here you have a microscope. You, you're looking at the, um, where are you looking? You're looking down here, and it's an inverted microscope. So you have a bulb that shines a yellow, uh, the, here a yellow light through the condenser, through the slide, and into the camera. So that's how you see the cell. How do you measure the torque on a bacterial cell that is 45 nanometers in diameter? Well, what you do is you take the cell, and you break off the flagellum. So it just has a little stub, just the little uh, end of the flagellum. And you stick that to a surface. And it turns out very, very conveniently that these flagella, are, the flagella stubs are quite sticky. So they will stick to almost anything. Uh, and if you just put these, these uh, deflagellated cells into, uh, uh, into a, a little, um, uh, on a slide, some of them will stick to the slide, and they will be free to rotate. So they will just spin around in a circle. And the bacterium thinks it's going somewhere, but of course it's not going anywhere. It's just spinning around and then counter-rotating. The, the torque of the motor is being uh, um, opposed by the, the Stokes drag of the cell. And the Stokes drag of the cell you can calculate really nicely using the techniques that we've learned about this morning. It's, a, it's an ellipsoid of about a mic of two microns long. It's in close proximity to a wall, which you have to take into account. But you can look at the, uh, how fast that thing spins in the clockwise and the counterclockwise direction. Now, how do you actually vary the torque? Well, that's the clever part, is you take an optical trap. So you focus a, an infrared laser from the bottom going up. That focus of the infrared laser generates a um, a gradient of optical density, of optical intensity. And here you use the fact that, the, that, the, uh, that a dielectric bead, a dielectric material, is, uh, is uh, influenced by the, by the power of, the, of light. And in, in, the, in, the, in a gradient, it will be drawn towards the maximum. So there's a, there's a force gradient that is generated by the optical trap. Yes? Uh, yes, but it is easy to tell because you because the you can basically watch the cell going around. Which GRF? Ground resistance matrix. I, I didn't know that, but I just assumed that it was so gram. But do you know how do they do they treat it as an ellipsoid or do they account for the wall? It's probably dominated by the wall. They well they do both. So they, they treat it as an ellipsoid in proximity to a wall. So you're correct, it, it probably is. And there's a there's a fair amount of hand waving that goes on here in the sense that you don't know quite how far away you from the wall you are. And of course the the drag is extraordinarily sensitive to the distance from the wall. So so there's you, you do um, so this is why it's called relative torque. The shape is the same, right? So it's a linear problem. So if you apply, if you if you change the loading on the on the on the system, you can you can um, scale this thing up and down. I don't know if that answered the question, but all right. So so you use this laser trap, and and what they do is they move. The, so there's the there's the center of rotation where the flagellum is attached. The flagellum stub is attached. The bacterium is trying to rotate counterclockwise. You take a bead a little dielectric polystyrene bead, and you literally block the rotation of the bacterium right there. And by measuring the displacement of that bead, which is the displacement of the laser beam, 
which you then calibrate against the photo detector, you can then find what is the force being exerted on that bead in the laser trap. And then you can move that laser trap around. And in fact, you can force the cell. You, if you move the laser trap in a circle, you can force the motor to go at any speed you want. Uh, 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 you can force the motor to go at any speed you want and at the same time measure the torque. Again, uh, a, ser a whole series of, of papers built, built on this, a very beautiful technique and one that I, uh, you know, that is worthwhile paying attention to. Yes? Yes, so, the, so the, the, uh, you, what you do is you move this laser trap. Uh, um, so, so this is looking from the side. And what you do is you move the laser trap around like that so that you're moving the, you're, you're parallel to the, to the plane of the, of the substrate. All right, so this is how we measure the bacterial motor performance. And we get uh, the torque and the speed performance that comes out of it. And the, the takeaway message to remember is constant torque motor. Effectively, at, at operating conditions, during the run mode, it's a constant torque motor. And we're going to need that when we come back to how the, how the bacteria synchronizes its flagella, how it, how it uh, organizes its flagella. All right. So now we come to the hydrodynamics part. And we can ask our questions, what are the hydrodynamics of these flagella, uh, or these flagella organisms? Uh, and oh, gosh, oh, yeah, no, it is here. So, um, so, uh, so we have, uh, if, we, if we break it down into a very prototypical cell, we have the, the payload, which is the cell body. We have a single flagellum, which, is, which represents the bundle. So remember, the bundle is maybe five uh, cells, uh, five flagella that are bundled together. Each one of them is 20 nanometers. They bundle at atomically close to each other. We'll still come to your question about how they bundle. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but it's still, uh, th this might be 100 nanometers versus 10 microns. It's still a long, thin, slender body. Uh, this, the, the, the motor is rotating the flagellum with a certain frequency and a certain torque. Remember, this is a torque-free, force-free system. So the, the, the um, motor is generating some thrust. Uh, the, the cell body, in order to, to generate a, a torque-free system, the cell body must be counter-rotating. So the cell body is rotating in the opposite direction in order to uh, counterbalance the torque that is generated. And it's also moving forward so that they have a Stokes drag on the whole system that is counterbalancing the thrust generated by the propeller or by the helix. Okay? So we have a torque-free, force-free system um, that is both translating and rotating. And how does it do this? Well, this comes down to this system. I've, I'll mention it here, and I'll, we'll come back to it once again. If nothing else comes out of this week, you will remember something about the relationship between the force in the parallel direction and the force in the perpendicular direction. So here's quiz number one, right? Which is larger, the force in the parallel direction or the force in the perpendicular direction? If, you ha if I have a slender rod, which is an element of this helix, a slender rod, it has a force in the parallel direction and it has a force in the perpendicular direction. Which is larger? Who thinks the force in the perpendicular direction is larger? Everyone, you, you, ha you have to vote. This is like voting in Australia. You have to vote. <laughs> Who thinks the force in the parallel direction is larger? Oh, thank you. We have a, a ringer. <laughs> so I have this moving, per moving upwards, and I, and I haven't specified the angle. But if I had 45, if I had 45 degrees, sure. <laughs> OK, I'm not going to. This was the warm-up quiz, so I'm not going <laughs> to grade it. But be warned, there will be more. So let's take a look at this. This is an element of that helix. It's moving up as it rotates. So the velocity is upwards. It, it's at some angle, which is due to the geometry of the helix. Uh, so if we decompose that into a perpendicular velocity and a parallel velocity, each one of those is resisted by a drag force. There's a drag force in the parallel direction and a drag force in the perpendicular direction. The way this is drawn, you might be able to guess which one is larger. Right? That's always a good um, 
technique on a quiz. If you're not quite sure the answer is to look at the drawing and you figure it out. And in fact, that yes, the, the force in the in the, the resisting force in the perpendicular direction is larger. And if we look at the sum of the uh, the, the, the vector sum of the parallel and the perpendicular force, we get a vector force. This is a drag-based force, right? It's due to the resistance to motion, but there is a component of it that is pushing forward. So there is a propulsive force due to the rotation, due to the, the translation of this element, and that generates a propulsive force. It also generates a huge drag force, right? So there's a lot of drag associated with this, but there is a part that is moving forward, and if we integrate that over the entire length of the flagellum, we get a propulsive force that pushes, pushes the cell forward. Okay, and we'll come back to that in a little more detail. So we can ask a whole slew of questions about this. We can ask, what's the thrust force generated? Can we calculate that? We can ask, how efficient is that motion? So in other words, if you twist it with a certain uh, power then, um, and you generate a certain velocity or force going forward, how efficient is that motion? For a given torque, in other words, for a given power in the motor, how fast will this organism swim? Uh, if we think of the, the helix as being not a rigid body, but a flexible body, then how does that motion and that, those, that force distribution affect the motion of the, the, the shape of the helix? And, and in turn, how's the, how does the, any change in the shape of the helix affect the, the uh, hydrodynamics? What about the head? We've kind of ignored the head here. What, the, there's a cell body here, which of course is important. That's, what's, that's the, uh, the, the uh, those are the goods. That's, that's why the animal lives. Uh, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole slew of questions. We're not going to be able to address all of them, but hopefully some of them we can talk about. So the next couple of slides are poor man's summaries of either what you've seen in the last day and a half or what you will see uh, tomorrow. Um, so we can, in order to solve these questions, we have to solve uh, problems of fluid structure interactions at low Reynolds number. So, there's the gain the Navier-Stokes equations. There are the Stokes equations. And um, the general solution to that, which, we, which Howard outlined today, well, actually, several people, Michael, so I think, outlined them yesterday, was uh, the Green's function, which, where you have this Stokeslet, which is the, the, uh, the, delta, the delta function solution to the, Navier, to the Stokes equation, which has these, these terms. This, this, uh, and I've, I've written a 1 here instead of a. I've written things in bold when I think that they're tensors or vectors, but I'm not consistent, so don't hold me to this. Um, but I think I have more or less the basic shape right. Um, there is this uh, viscous, ter viscous I'm, I'm also, just to keep everyone on their toes, so Mike said yesterday that, that it's important to approach these problems from multiple directions and not in any particular order. That, that's how people learn better. I also strongly believe that it's important to deliberately make mistakes to keep, yeah, you, you'll buy that, okay. And I, but I actually, I actually honestly believe that, that uh, a little variation in notation is not a bad thing, that it, because it forces you to say, what, 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 why is there an eta there? Oh yeah, that's what everyone else is using mu for. So I've discovered that in physics, people tend to use eta, in engineering, they tend to use mu, and there's a diffusion boundary where people use either or both. Um, and so just be aware that oftentimes I will be using eta to represent the molecular viscosity the, uh, the, the, uh, of the fluid. All right, so we have this, uh, we have this Stokeslet solution, this, this primary solution to the, to the Stokes equations. It's also often called the Osain tensor. And, uh, and I want to just remind people of its structure, which we've seen now a few times. Number one is there's a 1 over R dependence. So you have long-range hydrodynamic forces. So things will interact with each other in a, in a strong way because these, these uh, Stokeslets uh, decay slowly. The second thing, which again we've seen, is depending on the, that should be a boldface F, I think, depending on the, the orientation of the force and the orientation of the, uh, and the, and the location of the velocity, so the, 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 the dot product between this guy and the force will depend whether you're parallel or perpendicular whether the motion is parallel or perpendicular to the force. And so we have this drag an anisotropy. And you can see that right here, that these two will add up or, or, will, or this one will go to zero, depending on whether we're par par parallel or perpendicular to the force. So we've seen this now again and again, the anisotropy related 
to the direction of motion versus the direction of, of action. Okay, so that's the basic, that's what we start with. Um, I'll also remind you, this is, we saw this briefly this morning again, that because these are linear equations, if we're good, by some mechanism, we can contract all of these, uh, all, we can contract everything down into a rather uh, simple form, which is that the force and the torque I'm using L here. I think later on I might use something else. But <laughs> force and torque are related to the speed and the rotation by this um, tensor, really. It's, a, it's not a matrix, but I'll call it a, te I'll call it a matrix. It looks like one. Um, where we have, uh, we have the, um, uh, the four terms in the, in the, in the tensor, the, the primary terms, which relate force to velocity and torque to rotation, and then the cross terms, which are transpose of each other, as Howard mentioned earlier. Uh, that, that, are, that is what relates uh, force to rotation or, or uh, torque to uh, speed. So, so you, have, uh, um, you have this structure that is really, if you, can, if you can reduce your system down to that structure, you can actually do a huge amount. And remember, this is, each one of these is a, um, at least a 3 by 3 matrix for x, y, and z, but could be more if you're looking at multiple elements along the, along the structure. You can invert this and you get what's known as the mobil mobility tensor or mobility matrix. And just as an example, if you had a sphere moving through a fluid, right? So a sphere moving through a fluid just, just experiences Stokes drag. And so in that case, the mobility, um, the, the resistance matrix for that is that is you just have uh, Stokes drag in all three directions. So the, the force is linearly related to the velocity by 6 pi uh, A to R. And uh, the rotation is linearly related to the torque by, by the Stokes, uh, by the equivalent solution for the, for the rotation. So this would be a very simple example of this resistance matrix. All right, how am I doing on time? What? I didn't. <laughs> Between, say that again? B and N. Um, well, the, this, the, this is the inverse of that in some, in some gen general sense. Uh, so beyond that, I won't, I won't try and answer it, but, but uh, it, um, because, because it, it's going to depend on structure, I guess. But all right, so how much? Total of the whole two lectures. Mm -hmm. How are we doing? Do we need to take a break, or we should we just keep going? Keep going, okay, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, did you get that on camera? God. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, is it, these are gonna be streamed live. I've told my father that he can watch me lecture, so he's, he's very excited, so. All right, so, um, okay, we just talked about uh, the, the, uh, the Green's function solution, so now we can also, uh, w we haven't learned this yet, but I think, Howard, you're gonna talk about boundary element methods tomorrow, you mentioned it already. Uh, Mike, yeah, Mike talked about it uh, yesterday, so, so this is again coming at a different angle. Um, but if you, using the reciprocal theorem, you can construct a solution based on the integrals around the boundary, and uh, here is a, very nice example of how we can do that. Um, we have a, if we're just interested in the hydrodynamics of a helix, we could do this. And if, uh, I'm, I'm drawing from a, a nice result that, that uh, one of a, a postdoc who worked with me, Bin Lu, uh, actually worked with Mike as well, right? So, so there's a lot of <laughs> cross fertilization going. Yeah. Um, so uh, you can take this, uh, you can take the helix and you can recognize the fact that if you have a infinite or, or almost a, not necessarily infinite but an almost infinite helix so a long slender body that looks pretty much the same here as it does here then you can actually go through a reduction in uh, so by using a boundary element method as Mike mentioned yesterday you take a three-dimensional problem and you reduce it to a two-dimensional problem because you only have to integrate around the boundary now because we have a helix which has its own internal geometry we can take a two-dimensional problem and we can reduce it to a one-dimensional problem because the, the solution here, which normally depends on the solution there, but the solution there is the same as the solution here. It's just twisted and translated. 
So with a, uh, a clever and somewhat um, uh, involved a series of transformations, you can reduce the helical problem, the three-dimensional helical boundary integral method, into a one into a, 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 a one-dimensional uh, integration around the circle. Um, uh, so this this represents the fact that that you can you can uh, represent the entire helical flow just by considering the geometry there, and this allows you to look at any helix of any geometry, um, and you can generate, for example, here the stress. The, uh, the, the stress tensor on the surface, and you can generate the drag and so forth. So that's one way to do these things. Uh, and you can see that the colors here don't show very well. Uh, but this is the result that you get if you want to generate the velocity around a, tra a rotating helix. So this is a cut through the, um, through the middle of that helix. It's spinning uh, here. And this is an experiment that we did in the lab just to, uh, to measuring, you can see here, a macroscopic helix rotating in an extremely viscous fluid. So the Reynolds number is preserved. This is a rigid helix. You can see the little reflective particles that are being used to generate the PIV. And you get this flow. This is looking at the vertical velocity. So the vertical velocity says that the flow is moving upwards as the helix moves upwards. And there is this kind of virtual fluid helix that is intertwined between that is co-rotating downwards and that is the propulsive force that is being generated by the flow um, to propel the to, to propel the, the animal forward question yes absolutely I'll show you an example of that in, a, in well I'll show you another example but it works with any any helical geometry or even quasi helical because because you take advantage of the fact that the, the, if it's slowly varying in the, in the axial direction, uh, you, you can asymptotically you can correct for that as well. So you can look at finite helices or the, if you're, you know, worm-like helical shapes like um, spirochetes, things like that. All right, so, so here's an example of the flow field that you can get from a boundary element method, again, from a single one-dimensional integration. Uh, as you mentioned, you could also look at different kind of geometries that have helical geometry. And this is an interesting question from a physics perspective as well, because most bacteria do not live out in the ocean. Or, well, actually, most bacteria do live out in the ocean. But many bacteria live in confined systems. They live in, um, in soil or in um, the pores of, of your body. It's kind of creepy to think about it, but there are millions or billions of bacteria in your stomach or in your gut or in your or all kinds of places. And so again, using a variety of techniques, and certainly we're not the only people to do this. Many people have looked at, at uh, uh, bacteria or helical motion in confined geometries. But here's one example of it using this reduction technique where you take the helix and another helical geometry is a tube. It's a very boring helix, but it has a helical geometry. So you can reduce this three-dimensional geometry into, uh, again, a, uh, a pair of integrals uh, around a pair of circles. So you have a, the, the helical shape and you have the confining shape. And now you can see a little bit about what, what happens to a, a cell if it is confined. Well, if you think about it, the effect of the wall is to generate, uh, uh, because of the 1 over r reduction, it generates a little more drag. And so if you have enough power to keep rotating, your grip on the wall, if you like, is increased. And so your, your, torque, your torque against the wall is incre increased. And so you will screw yourself through the fluid a little bit, a little bit faster. So as the, as the system becomes more and more confined, you will, you will be able to travel faster. And that's what's shown here as the radius here uh, decreases. So you go from this uh, large, unconfined flow to a small confined flow, the velocity compared with the uh, free stream velocity, so this is one here, increases. And there's three different geometries here for three different kinds of helices, the so-called normal curly and coil. Which feature of the helix is this? The outer, the outer locus of the helix gets bigger and goes faster? Is that what you're no, I'm saying is this circle, as the confinement increases. That's the cross-section of the so, so this... This is the helix, oh, and, that's the, and that's the confining tube. So it's a helix in a tube. 
like snakes on a plane. But well, one's high Reynolds number, one's low Reynolds number. Yeah. Um, <laughs> workshop, I'm not sure that's the <laughs> I was, like I was serious. Yes, that's right. Not the, not the plane that you considered. I'm talking about the aeroplane plane. He, Mike had a paper, snakes on a plane, which is snakes on a, on a flat surface. <laughs> right, no, this is a helix in a tube. Doesn't quite have the same ring, but helix in a tube. So as the tube... <laughs> yeah, I pitched it to Hollywood. They just don't like it. Um, okay, let's, let's just move on. <laughs> Right, so here is the confining tube as the confining tube, and you can think of the tube as a pore or as a, a space between, a, um, between two blobs of, of soil or as the uh, interstitial space between, uh, in, in, a, in a gel of some kind. So, you can, so as this confinement increases, if you have enough torque, if you can continue to increase your torque, you can swim faster. That shouldn't surprise people. <laughs> The trouble is, is, as we remember, these motors are constant torque motors. They don't have enough torque. They, at some point, they stall. They, they maintain the same torque even as the load goes up, and eventually that load goes down. And more, more physically, they have limited, they have a finite amount of power. So, uh, so a, a, a different way of thinking about it is if you have a fixed amount of power to rotate and to, and to and the, the power is the is the rotation speed and the torque the product of that and there you can see that there is a uh, as you go th as you're far away is that there's little confinement you're going at the free stream speed and as you confine the system you get a little bit of an increase as that confinement kicks in but then very rapidly you run out of torque you can't propel yourself any faster and so that that uh, you go to zero speed and of course as the confinement goes to really kicks in uh, to a very very high degree then you you eventually stop dead uh, i've i've shown this here for three different geometries of helix and we're going to talk uh, i think if not now then very shortly we will talk about the different geometries of helix and how they affect uh, motion so this is but but the other reason to talk about this is is that we are we're talking about the, the uses, one of the uses of, of a boundary integral method as a, as a means to solve these problems. A question there. That's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, the, the, the question was, do they swim under maximum power? No, in fact, I, I do know the answer to that. They don't swim under maximum power. So the, the typical torque line... So if you plot the, the torque, I'll call it L, like before, versus the speed, it looks approximately like that. Uh, and the load line looks like this. So, so they're more or less swimming at that point, which means that as they, get, as they get loaded more heavily, either by increasing the viscosity or by confining them, this load line moves up like that. And so they... they Sorry, the load line meaning the, the so this is a co this would be a constant load on the bacterium. Um, it, it, it's just a reflection that the 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 um, the, uh, the torque. So the force on the head of the bacterium is trying to resist the motor is pushing on it, so that's like the force on the head, the body. That's the so that's the yes, the drag force on the head. So, so for a given for a given uh, resistance, you you have to lie on s somewhere on this on this line. You have to be you have to be rotating at a certain speed with a certain torque. Uh, so let me just finish this thought. So as if you increase the viscosity of the fluid, which people do, or if you uh, confine the system, which people do, or if you somehow um, some other means, if you confine, if you restrain them magnetically or something, you push them in this direction towards stall, towards, towards a zero speed, and at some point they can't move any further. But, but to answer the direct question, it's are they operating at maximum power? No. They, they can continue to operate at more or less the same 
uh, well, the maximum power would be, uh, actually, this is more subtle than I was thinking. So is it maximum power? I'm not sure. There was another question. Yeah. Yeah, and in this calculation, no, but in general, yes. So in general, uh, a, a more complete boundary integral method could and could and has in included the head. So um, there have been, and I, I'm blanking on a specific reference, but I know that various people have done um, boundary integral calculations. And there, there are other techniques that I'll mention in a second where they've done full simulations of, of uh, head body, uh, head tail combinations. So let me, yes. Um, the torque is that so the torque here is more is a, a little bit of a slanted line but but it's but it's not heavily slanted so it's finite at, zero. at zero yes the, the, it, at, it's finite at zero um, speed yeah there is a store the, if you remember those those experiments uh, by by Berg about the torque that so they measure a finite torque at, at zero speed yes sorry Not in this method, but thank you. Well, the original one, not in confined space, but with a head and a tail long preceded that. There was some uh, uh, man, fan, man in uh, yes. uh, 1980 something that made an attempt at this with an early version of that. Right. But not with a no, 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 that's right. So, the, yeah, the, uh, that's, that's correct. So, so there have been several and, imp and continually improving methods uh, to, to, to do the simulations for this. All right, let me uh, push ahead. So here's another technique, which again, I don't know whether we'll talk about tomorrow. No, this is, uh, this is Ricky Cortez well, and Lisa Fauci and Ricardo. Ricardo. Oh, he goes by Ricardo, sorry. Ricardo Cortez, Lisa Fauci, and several other people. So you can, you can take the, um, you can take the, um, uh, the, 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 this, uh, the Stokes alert, and Howard kind of alluded to this a little bit when he was talking about the, uh, the again, the anisotropic drag. You can align those Stokes alerts along the body. And so, for example, you could take this cilia and you could replace it by a series of Stokes alerts, finite Stokes alerts, and you could sort of do a numerical uh, uh, sort of um, integration of this. Uh, now you have to worry a little bit about it because the Stokes lid itself is becomes singular at the at the origin at r is equal to zero. So you do what's called regularization using a regularization kernel, and I'm going to stop there because I don't know much. I, I can't speak with any authority about it, except for the fact that you have this this epsilon term, uh, which allows you which allows the Stokes lid to remain finite at the uh, at its um, origin and allows you to numerically assemble these regularized Stokes. And this function is chosen and the value of epsilon is chosen in such a way as to match the far field or to, to make some matching with the, with the analytic solution. So the advantage of this, and again, I'm, I, like I say, the math is impressionistic, so don't pay too much attention to it. <coughs> but what you can do is you can replace the, the, uh, the boundary integral method with a, with a, instead of an integral with a summation, uh, you, can sum, you can sum over these regularized Stokes slits. You can put all of these together into a single finite uh, dimensional matrix. You can invert that matrix to find the values of these Stokes slits, the values of the forcing at the, at the, fo at the point. Because, it is a, because we're in the Stokes flow and this is a quasi-steady um, problem, we can do this at each instant in time. And if we wanted to, we could, for example, include uh, we could couple it with a with a, uh, a tech, uh, with a uh, structural model to allow the the, the Stokeslets to move to deform, and so you can come up with this. So this is a numerical method uh, that has achieved a lot of success, certainly by people like myself, because it's really easy to use. It's and it's very powerful. Yeah. Um, uh, so, like, so no, this is this is two, five, this is replacing the delta function in oh. the in the Green's integral. Is that right? Yeah. Thank you. 
So this is replacing it. So this looks like a delta function. Okay. And as, as epsilon goes to 0, it, it um, Yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that's essentially my, uh, my poor man's understanding, is that it allows you to execute the, or to evaluate the, the uh, Green's function integral in a finite, in a, in a sort of a discrete manner. And so the Green tensor is modified? The, the Osain tensor, yeah, you know, the Green's tensor is modified. Uh, um, and I mean, it, it, it's certainly in here, and, and it's been, there's actually uh, several. I mean, it's been used by many people otherwise. Yeah. So the AT reference there is actually uh, a little known typo in that paper in the form of pressurized blade. There's a dying error. That explains my confusion. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. Thank you. Yeah. That's the general walkout. Right, OK. So the, the example I'm giving here is, is a cilia which we haven't talked, which we're not talking about today, but it's an active filament that is moving in a viscous fluid and would be extraordinarily complicated to solve. Well, it wouldn't, I mean, you could solve it by all kinds of methods, but this, in this case, is solved using these regularized Stokes slits. And again, you can evaluate the velocity, fun the velocity field and all the forces at every point in space and time. How's it actuated? Uh, what, how's the, what, what are they trying to show here with this? It's actuated the base, or what? In this case, it's actuated. Uh, throughout. So I don't want to talk about the oh. physics if I'm just using it as an example. So tomorrow we'll talk about cilia. Um, but um, but in, it is actuated throughout as a, as a bending stress. They, they, you impose a bending stress. All right. The last one that I'll mention is the simplest of the lot. Uh, actually, it's not the last one. But it's uh, almost the last one, is, res is resistive force theory. Now, we talked a lot about slender body theory, and I'll mention that very briefly one more time. But resistive force theory is even simpler than slender body theory. Slender bo uh, the, the, uh, and resistive force theory says that I'm not even going to do an integral. That's too, too much work for me. I'm, what I'm going to do is at, at each point along the structure, I'm just going to use these anisotropic um, uh, force coefficients, the, basically the fact that the parallel uh, force coefficient is, is uh, uh, twice as much as, is half as much as the, the, the perpendicular force coefficient. And I'm just going to evaluate the local velocity here. And uh, use, knowing the local velocity, I'm going to evaluate the forces. And I'm going to ignore any interaction with the rest of the elements. And we know that that's wrong because we know there's this 1 over r dependence. So the, the, the structure here, which is very close by, certainly has an influence on the structure here. So we know that this is wrong. But if we do it carefully, and it's been done carefully by several people over the years. Gray and Hancock started uh, in the 50s. Lighthill um, uh, has done some. Uh, Johnson, I think, did more. Um, there, there's been a lot of developments in resistive force theory to make to, to take advantage of different situations. But if you go through the analysis, what you can do is you can separate out the general solution into a local solution and the contribution from everything else. And then you can evaluate this contribution to everything else in a kind of approximate way uh, in terms of the local solution. And then the end result is you, you end up with a very simple uh, relationship between the local velocity and the local force, which has this simple um, anisotropic tensor or anisotropic coefficient, which has, once again, this logarithm term, which we like with it because we have a slender body, has viscosity, and it has the anisotropy associated with the parallel versus perpendicular forces. So a couple of questions here. Yeah. No. Oh, is, is, this is the same? Okay. It's, it is the same then, yeah. Yeah. May I ask the same question again? Because I said I can, I can remember, I can hear things in the sense of an answer. Is that specified somewhere in the or? Uh, is so so I, I defer to Mike. Is, it, 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 I think it's justified, <laughs> it's justified in the, as the slenderness goes to zero. And I mean, uh, and we'll, well, let me jump to what there's, a, there's some corrections we can make for curvature. Uh, so it is justified, but, it, but um, can, can I make yes. 
No, absolutely. In the asymptotics, that term that you're neglecting, the non-local term, okay, so the leading order term is the logarithmic inequality. So stand up so everyone can hear. <laughs> I'm going to say this again, actually. Right? Oh, okay. So the, the leading term is logarithmic, and the next term, that integral term, is order one. So if you ever do any asymptotics, that's a pretty damn weak separation. Yeah. A log term and an order one term. So they are kind of formally separated asymptotically, but... It's, so it's the good. The other term remains an integral. So the other term remains an integral. Yeah. yeah. So the advantage, however, of this is that it's really, uh, it's really easy, and it gives you a pretty good idea as to what's going on. Uh, it's you know it's a bit hand waving, but to factor to a factor of two, it pro well, better than two, it's probably good. I just add, I'll say one thing in specifically about this though, which is. Uh, if you look at this kind of formulation, which just says that the, uh, the uh, drag coefficients have, are separated by a factor of two, there's a very obvious problem. And that you can see that this is uh, uh, Eric Lauger and Tom Powers point this out in, in their review article, and it's a very nice way of seeing it. If you consider two filaments, one is a circle and one is a straight line, they have the same length. And it's, they're, they're sedimenting in a viscous fluid. So according to the resistive force theory, these should sediment at the same speed because they have the same linear length and they're sedimenting, sedimenting par, uh, perpendicular. Uh, the velocity is perpendicular to the filament, right? So they should sediment at the same. According to resistive force theory, they will sediment at the same speed. OK, quiz number two, which one goes faster? How many people think the ring will sediment faster? OK. Okay, which, so the question is, and you have, I'm going to play the Jeopardy or, you know, a, a little tune where you can think about it. Which one goes faster? Does this one sediment faster than that one or vice versa? So think, you can talk with your neighbor. It's, it's a cooperative quiz. They're stiff filaments. Don't yell out the answer. I'm going to take a poll. So, so discuss it with your neighbor for a minute. Which one is going to, is going to sediment faster in a gravitational flow? I, I, I'm glad you. S <laughs> so those of you who are not sure, there's a vigorous discussion going on here in the front row between <laughs> Olivia, Anka, and Mike. They're talking about dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So a show of hands. Which, which, how many people think that this, that the ring will sediment faster? Show, raise your hand. And how many people think that the, fil the straight filament will sediment faster? OK. OK, and there, how many people don't know? OK. This one will go a little bit. This one will go faster. Now, why is that? Well, think of it. So, so the, why, first of all, why are they different? Well, because there's hydrodynamic interaction. So, so this one, uh, the, the part of, of uh, this filament will actually have an influence on this filament, on this piece, will actually have an influence on this piece. The difference between these two is that on average, the filament is closer to, uh, to its neighbors here than here, right? On average, there's more hydrodynamic interaction here than here. Why does that make it go faster? OK, well, think about a, a point here that is falling. So that point here is falling, is generating, is dragging fluid with it. And as it drags some fluid with it, some of that fluid is actually there. Uh, one over, like 1 over r or 1 over 2r away is, is being dragged down by this piece. So this one is actually feeling the, the pull of, the, of its neighbors. So it will, that's my hand-waving version to say why, it will, why this one will go faster. Did I get that right? I think I did. Um, well, in resistive force theory, you do re ignore the end effects. So in resistive force theory, you, you only look at the local contribution. So the fact that this is on the end versus here, no difference. All right. So uh, in order to correct for this, there have been several corrections which take into account curvature. And here are a couple. There's the, uh, there's the uh, uh, Gray and Hancock. Light Hill has a version. 
there are, and, and in fact, I'm confused because I've seen this in different versions, but all attributed to Light Hill, and they may be typos or maybe they're just different ways of expressing a logarithm. I'm not sure. But just be aware that there are corrections for curvature, which here is expressed as a wavelength. And, um, and so you can improve yourself a little bit. And in fact, what you can do is if you know the geometry, you can go through the full boundary integral method or slender body theory, and you can derive resistive force coefficients that apply specifically to your geometry. And so you can actually get pretty accurate resistive force coefficients for your particular case. These are widely used for, for a, a, a variety of uh, applications. All right, the last one, which I won't talk about because it's been mentioned before, is, and I think is, again, slender body theory. Once again, you have this long, thin uh, assumption, which, which a, a helix is, is a perfect candidate for, and that allows you to, in my, again, in my mind, is to replace the, the body with a, a, a line of, of Stokeslets, which are evaluated uh, at the center, and, to, and, and, uh, and then you can solve an integral equation in order to generate the flow around the helix. And as long as this is more or less uh, accurate, you get extremely nice, accurate solutions to the flows around these slender bodies. And here's a nice example of that by uh, Sverio Spagnoli and Eric Lauga, who is Sverio is another of these people who has worked with multiple people in the room at one point or another, um, and as is, as is Eric, I suppose. Um, um, and, uh, and they solved, uh, we'll come back to their solution, as to solve, they solved for a wide variety of helical geometries, they can solve the slender body calculation to calculate the flows and the torques and the power. All right, so what do we do with this? We can ask a question, how, how am I doing on time now? Almost finished, oh gosh. So I'm not, gonna, so I'm not even going to finish what I thought I would. So I'll finish this little section and then we'll come back. Well, tomorrow we'll have to adjust. So, um, boy, I didn't get anywhere close to finishing. I guess that's good. No, I, I well, I'll, okay. So the helices are not rigid. Uh, they are stiff, but they're not rigid. And, and in fact, it's well known that the the geometry of these helices changes. Uh, not only do they bend in the sense that they, they, they uh, bundle and unbundle, but they also uh, bend and they change their, their, their um, helical mode. And there are, in fact, 12 modes of helical geometry that are known and that are admitted by the molecular structure. So let me play that video again. You can see it there. Uh, there are these so-called normal mode, the coiled mode, the semi-coiled, the curly one and curly two that are observed. And you can see there's a, there's a curly, uh, there's the normal, there's a coiled mode somewhere. Any, so you can see them going through this ex, this, this, these polymorphic transformations. Uh, here's a whole series of those. And we can ask which one of these, um, these which uh, uh, mode is, 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 is best for swimming, or in fact, generically, which, which kind of uh, helical shape is best for swimming. So again, this was calculated quite exhaustively and beautifully by Sverio and Eric uh, about a few years ago. You can divide the helix into a circumferential and a pitch uh, mode, so you can look at any helix in terms of its pitch and circumference, and all the helices land on this circle. Um, the dotted line means that they are uh, the, these ones are helices that, that are rotating. Uh, I guess that's a right-handed helix, and these ones are left-handed helices. Um, and uh, the, the solid, uh, the, the symbols are all of the examples known to nature that they were able to find of, of these um, geometries. If you look at the efficiency of these, calculating slender, using slender body theory to calculate, you get, again, the pitch and the circumference. These are contours of the efficiency. You can see there's a nice line of high efficiency modes here and high efficiency modes. This is for the uh, right-handed helix and for the left-handed helix. And uh, you can see that there is a, uh, uh, that the, uh, the normal mode, the one that we see most of the time in nature, actually lies right on that peak of maximum efficiency. And that's, again, reflected here that the, the efficiency, which is a massive 1.2% um, is uh, maximized in the so-called normal mode of the helix. 
one could think that this is an evolution, an evolutional uh, response. Uh, bacteria have been evolving for about three billion years or so. And uh, over the years, they have uh, at least tried to optimize something. And even though this is very low, uh, by the way, how do we define efficiency? It's a little tricky. You ask the question, how much power do I put into the torque? So the torque times speed versus, so that's the power, that's the required motor power, versus the power it would take just to drag the helix through the fluid. If I were just to drag it as a, uh, as a towed body, this is called the cost of, cost of locomotion. Um, it's widely used in the biology literature. Purcell used it for this, uh, for this application. I realize why people do that, but if you're really thinking about evolution, you would think the right, a better definition would be to estimate how much energy I consume versus how much energy, you know, how much work done I get out of it. Because this is comparing two, one quantity that has nothing to do with the bacteria. Right, well... It's a nice quantity of power, but... Yeah. So, so, so biologists, yeah, no, I agree. So the, the, the point is, is, sorry? So, the, so Howard's comment was that, that this, this measure of efficiency is widely used, uh, but it's sort of meaningless because, because the, drag, the power to drag the helix or the body through the fluid is, you know, is not a meaningful, I mean, mechanically it means something, but but biologically, it, it doesn't happen. So uh, there may be a better measure of efficiency with respect to biology. And so I, I have to put on my biology hat. I've spent a lot of time working in biology, and I, I do it for my, multiple species. The biologists care very little about efficiency. Uh, and so their answer is, who cares about efficiency? These guys have lived for, for 4 billion years. That's good enough, right? They, the only efficiency you need is to survive and to multiply. And um, uh, so, so, the, so efficiency is a little bit of a, a red herring, as we'd say. Uh, ha having said that, on the other hand, there are, you know, so bacteria does many things apart from swim. It has to reproduce. It has to feed. It has to sense. It has to um, uh, survive cold. It has to survive hot. So it, it has many machines in its, in its place to, to do this. And swimming is only one piece of that, of that efficiency argument. Can I just add to that? I mean, I think one reason people don't say something about that kind of efficiency is because I mean, swimming for a bacteria is such a small part of the energy budget. That's right. That right, so swimming, uh, th that's a very good point. So, so swimming is really a, a very, uh, it get, it's, it's a small piece of, of what bacteria spend their energy on it. And in fact, a bacterium can live for days without food, can swim for days without food because it, it has enough energy in even the little one micron sphere. Yes. No, uh, and but the last counterpoint, and we're going to have to, I'm going to have to wrap up a little bit. The last counterpoint is that even if it's, um, that this is still a, a reasonable measure of power just to say how much does it cost to move. And if I'm interested from getting from A to B in order to feed, I have to measure my power somehow. I'm going to try to um, finish up uh, this little section very briefly. Um, so we've measured the force displacement coefficients of, actually we haven't, but once again, Howard Berg has measured the force displacement uh, characteristics of flagella using a technique very simple, simple, similar to what I described before, an optical trap with a bacteria, and the, the flagellum is trapped on the end, and you just pull the thing apart, and you can see uh, long, there's uh, torque twisting the thing, so you can measure how, how it uh, deforms, how, what, what its twist um, uh, modulus is, and its extension modulus just by dragging it apart like this. And you can see here it drags apart, and then there's a a sudden drop in the force, and that's due to these polymorphic transformations where suddenly it will extend into a new uh, helical mode and the stress will, re will relax and then it will stretch again. Okay, I'm going to, am I, I'm done, right, Olivier? So I didn't, I only did about 70% of what I wanted to talk about, so tomorrow I'll pick up again uh, and I'll just throw out a whole bunch of stuff so that we get through the week. So. We'll stop there because it's a long day.